As a grown man in 2024, sometimes you have to call yourself out on your own BS. Now, in terms of 2023, I had a great time making YouTube content around filmmaking, but at the same time, that didn't come with a ton of mistakes as a filmmaker that I had made. Now, in today's video, I'm gonna go over all the mistakes that I've made as a filmmaker, because if I tell you them now, you're less likely to make them. So, we're just gonna kinda get into it. Now, the first mistake that you wanna avoid is trying to think that you're gonna be the filmmaking Superman and trying to do everything, everywhere, all at once. Filmmaking is gonna take more than a day and some shoots are gonna take more than one day. Sometimes pre-production is gonna take more than an afternoon on Milanote in order for you to come up with a rough idea and then just hope it's gonna come out during the shoot. One of the mistakes that I made, especially because I was trying to turn over to get more content and do filmmaking at the same time, was I was trying to condense everything and trying to get everything done in a day because of all the resources and all the personnel it was gonna to take to make that happen in the first place. And then what ended up happening was I had some good looking stuff but I couldn't actually get enough to make a compelling story. Something that I learned and something that you might learn either the hard way or by watching this video is finding out that you don't actually need to do everything in a 24 hour period. You can take two or three days or weeks or even sometimes months or years in order to complete a project. And that's actually entirely fine and you're not less of a filmmaker for it. Next is getting location catfished, and that actually ends up happening when you don't physically see the location yourself, either because you didn't have the time, you didn't have the budget, or the location's far away. Now, I use services like Peerspace or Gigster in order to find locations for the shoots that I need to do for clients or for myself. And oftentimes they're a little bit out of the way and I get a bit lazy and I don't go and scout the location initially. This is a terrible idea in a lot of situations. Oftentimes things are gonna be a little bit smaller than they appear. We actually shot an interview for a documentary a couple of months ago, and when I up happening was the space looked great in the pictures but when I went to go and see it it was a lot smaller than I thought it was and I actually had to change my entire lighting plan and it didn't make the images that I necessarily wanted to. Now the excuse there might be that it was like an hour and a half away and it's hard to take three hours out of your day to drive to location look at it for an hour and then come back home but if you can control it try to actually scout the locations even though the pictures are online and you have everything booked and ready to go. Another mistake that I made was bringing the wrong tool to the right job or even the right tool to the wrong job. Now, gear is still going to have a standing within the types of productions you're gonna get into. It's still going to be an important thing no matter what anybody else on YouTube tells you. However, you wanna make sure that it's contextual to the shoot that you're actually doing. Now, with having something like a YouTube channel it becomes a little bit difficult because sometimes you have reviews or sponsored videos or there's a paid or an indirect incentive for you to use a particular piece of gear in order for you to move up farther in your content career, which I think is still fine, but you still have the responsibility to actually think about the context of what you're shooting and whether or not that it applies. This kind of goes into my first run with the Sony Venice. I actually kind of made it as a joke in terms of borrowing it and Sony Canada just kind of let me borrow it for a month, but I didn't actually have any projects, which means it was indeed the right gear in terms of having a high quality camera, but I didn't have the production that actually needed that gear. And instead I just had a bunch of pretty footage. I used a little bit of it for a review. I didn't really go any farther from there. Something you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you're keeping the right tools for the jobs that you're gonna be having. So for example, I do have this Sony FX3 and this 24 to 70 G Master lens, which is actually gonna cover a lot of things in terms of the client projects I have to do. Most often they're gonna be social media shoots or stuff for things like Google ads or Facebook ads or something like that, which actually doesn't require a ton of gear, especially if you're working with a smaller client. Using something like a Sony FX3 with great audio is going to be just fine. And that's actually a gig that I have next week. And maybe I didn't need to bring my Red Komodo X for that, but it was kind of fun when I did get to use it though. But you can use something as simple as this, a cage, one lens that has a decent zoom and a good audio handle and be more than fine for the majority of jobs. And everything else, those can be specialty times whenever you wanna get fancy. Now, a huge mistake I made in my filmmaking career is not picking music beforehand, but a sponsor like Toon Tank actually helps solve that problem a lot. Now, Toon Tank is gonna be a great resource for finding royalty-free and copyright-free music. It's nice because all you have to do is type in what you're looking for, and then it gets to work in finding the tracks that'll work for your next video project. Now, unlike some other music licensing offerings, you also can get the stems of the songs that you're looking for as well. Sometimes I don't need the entire track and I just need parts of it, and being able to download stems and sound effects on Toon Tank is going to be a major 
major help for my sound design. And also, if you're someone that's starting out and you don't have the biggest budget in the world, you can start Toon Tank for about seven bucks. For seven dollars, you can start off on the personal plan with Toon Tank. As video creators and filmmakers, having a wealth of options available in terms of your music and your sound design is gonna be something that's only gonna help you and not work against you. And Toon Tank is a great way to do that. Now, I am going to leave a link on the screen and the description down below, and that way you can start off with Toon Tank today, and it's incredibly inexpensive, so you can get started without having to break your budget. A special shout out to Toon Tank, but let's get back into talking about more things that I might've screwed up on and how I'm gonna fix them. Now, just like bringing the wrong gear to a job, you don't wanna bring the wrong personnel either. Look, as much as I love my creative friends, I can't hire every single one of them for every single job that I wanna do because sometimes having the improper personnel is even worse than bringing the wrong gear. When you are thinking of the context of the shoots that you're going to be doing, the things you wanna keep in context are also the people that you're gonna bring in order to execute on that project. Sometimes what ends up happening is that you might bring people on because they might have DM'd you on Instagram to be on set with you, or you're bringing on a friend to help put them on into a set situation, but you end up doing that instead of prioritizing the actual people that you need, and now you have two too many cooks in the kitchen. One of the problems that I had in 2023 was I might have not brought on the people that I actually needed for the gigs that I wanted to do, but what I started to do is that on some level, some of my sets started to feel like field trips for my friends, which isn't actually the smartest idea. Now, another mistake that I made as a filmmaker in 2023, and even before that, and even sometimes now, is thinking that I have something to prove. Look, being part of this YouTube space, especially in filmmaking, you're gonna feel the constant pressure of having to prove to the internet that you're a real filmmaker. And sometimes you do things that are a little bit out of character or even out of pocket in order to make sure that you're proving that to an audience that honestly doesn't care even when you do show up as a filmmaker. You might start to do things like force feeding BTS or focusing more on the actual content side of things to prove to the internet that you are part of this community rather than focusing and enjoying the process of production in general. Oftentimes what ends up happening is you put out all this BTS stuff and you put all these reviews and you want to make it as high value to the people watching as possible. But then what ends up happening is that something becomes lacking in your production. And then even when you do finish those projects, sometimes those same people that want you to be this real filmmaker and showing you a particular type of content don't even show up when the project is finished in the first place. In fact, oftentimes I find the people that critique who's a real filmmaker don't even go to the website of those people to see the work that they've actually done before. Now, rant aside, one of the things you want to consider, especially as doing something like this and creating YouTube content and getting into filmmaking is try to compartmentalize them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you have a camera review or two cameras that are versus each other, I don't think you necessarily need to make a Netflix film to demonstrate the cameras beside each other because in a real production setting, oftentimes you're probably not gonna see a Sony FX3 versus a Red Komodo X. You probably wanna see that in more of a testing situation where there is some low stakes and you don't have to worry about clients or actually making sure that you're making time on the day. And then when you do have things that are more production oriented, you can start to take little beats in here and there from that, but when you're on set, be locked in and be present. Because you never know when you're not thinking about the production fully what's gonna miss that shot or what's gonna be that interview question that's gonna hold your story together. Or when things don't go right and you have to think on the fly, if you're thinking so much about just getting the content side of things, you might actually not be able to think on your feet and actually make sure that the production actually ends up happening. This also contributes to the gigantic graveyard of unfinished projects that I have, but I do have a way of fixing that, which I am gonna put into another video, but you're gonna have to subscribe in order to do that because the vast majority of you guys aren't actually doing that. Now, this is for all my guys that like to shoot documentary style content. Now, what you might wanna do when you're doing your pre-interview is take the answers of that pre-interview and then in a way kind of rewrite the answers but still speaking in that person's words and then start to formulate that as your story. One of the things I was trying to do when I was trying to get into more doc style content was I did have the questions nailed down and that person did technically answer those questions, but when I went back and I edited some of the interview footage, I didn't necessarily have the answers to string together into a story. And if any of you ever get stuck with trying to piece together interview questions to kind of make a more compelling documentary, you might feel this pain. This is one of the mistakes that actually was a key contributor to me actually not really getting through the documentaries I wanted to shoot because the interviews went fine, but the answers to those questions didn't necessarily go the way I wanted to. Also, don't be afraid to ask something again or to let the person you're interviewing know what you're trying to go after. If it's something that doesn't align with the actual answer to the questions that you're asking, they'll probably just tell you. And if not, double check to make sure. But make sure that if you are doing things like pre-interviews or interviews, try to actually rewrite it into your own words or formulate it. That way that the answers that you might anticipate actually help you tell your stories rather than it just acting like a Q&A. Also, I don't know why I'm this close on a 16 millimeter lens. I'm having a lot of fun with it. I just got it and this is kind of nice. Actually, probably isn't. I look probably a little bit weird.
And the last one of my filmmaking mistakes is not actually focusing on more pre-production before I get into a shoot. Now, especially when you're doing things by yourself, pre-production is gonna be one of the most important steps. You wanna plan everything out to a T to make sure that things go as smoothly as possible. Just give me a second, one second. What you wanna make sure is you wanna make sure that things like your mood board, your storyboard, and your scripting is all on point before you actually show up on shoot day. One of the things that I did that was kind of lacking was I made a rough kind of copy of what I want things to be, and I didn't necessarily pay as much attention as I should have and making sure that I create a plan that I could execute on for those film projects. Now, there is somebody that I do have to applaud, which is going to be Jacques Crawford, who did make a video on a really cool pre-production workflow. Now, I'm going to leave that video over here because I'm going to make my own video and how I'm going to make a lot better pre-production in 2024. But until then, you could watch one of these guys and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.